All right, WITN, uh, please let me know when we have a quorum and if everything is uh, good on your end. Chairman Johnson, um, everything is good on our end and you do have a quorum. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Johnson. I'm the chair of the Finance and Economic Development Committee. This time I would like to call our J July meeting to order. Um, again, I'm, uh, um, I'm Chairman uh, Johnson from the 7th District. Um, now I will do a roll call to see who's present. Vice Chair Harley, 4th District. Present. <clears throat> um, Council Member Oliver, 3rd District is excused. Um, and so is Council Member Walsh at large. Um, Council Member Field, 8th District. Council Member Field. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, Council Member Spadola at large. Present. Okay. And Council President Congo. All right. And now uh, let me survey the rest of the attendees. Um, we have Council Member Field, 5th District. Present. And uh, I believe, oh, we have uh, Council Member Darby, 2nd District. Present. And Council Member McCoy, 6th District. Here. All right, and if anyone else from Council, of course, joins us, please let me know. Send me a message or a chat, and I will I'll make sure you're recognized at tonight's meeting. All right, um, we do have some of the uh, a pretty uh, meaty agenda this evening. As this is is the last committee meeting, of course, before uh, summer break for council. Um, so uh, let's just jump right to it. Um, the first on the agenda, as we've had um, almost uh, every month, uh, there is a finance committee meeting for the past year. Um, we have an update uh, from the administration on the city's um, use of ARPA funds. Um, do we have uh, Chief Steph Washington or someone from the administration here this evening? <clears throat> uh, good evening, Chairperson. Uh, that will be me, uh, Stephanie okay. Merkel. All right. All right, Ms. Mergler, the, the floor is yours, ma'am. Great. Uh, good evening, uh, Councilman Johnson and other members of council. Thank you for inviting me to present this uh, update on the ARPA funds. I will be giving a high level overview of amounts spent in each category. Uh, details on individual projects may be found on OpenGov. And if you have specific questions, I will be happy to answer them after the overview, which is as follows. In administrative costs, we had a budget of 1.7 million. We have spent about 450,000 and have a balance of 1.25 million remaining. In building safer communities, uh, we have allocated $8 million, spent 83,000, leaving a balance of about uh, 7.9 7 million left. In community investment, uh, we have a budget of $6 million. Uh, we have spent about 1.64 million and have a remaining balance of about 4.4 million left. Uh, last month, the uh, premium pay for essential workers did go out. Uh, we spent $2,645,318. In neighborhood revitalization, we have a budget of $21 million. We have spent about $5.7 million and have a budget remaining of about $15.3 million. Uh, revenue replacement, we did allocate $12 million during the uh, FY23 budget process. And finally, in workforce development, we have allocated $4 million and the full amount is still remaining. And does anybody have any questions? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Ms. Margler, for that uh, comprehensive overview. <clears throat> now, I haven't, um, I, 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 I must admit, I did not have a chance to go to the website uh, today. Mm -hmm. um, are the entities listed um, in which the distributions were made to? Are they on the website? On OpenGov, yes. So any, um, 
any entity uh, with whom we have a ARPA contract and with whom we have set up an account in a project in Munis um, are displayed on OpenGov. Uh, currently, the only uh, project for which we have a contract but not is not currently displaying on OpenGov would be Christina Cultural Arts Center. Uh, that one we just need to finish uh, setting up a project in, and budget in Munis, and that one will then be displayed. In the uh, $83,000 in building safer communities, was that the consultant uh, 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 contract for Mr. Chevrolet? Uh, it, it is from the Jersey. Uh, it is not. That is actually for the United Way. Uh, that is specifically uh, one moment. Um, that is specifically so. It is um, the project is called Community Re uh, Violence Prevention Initiative. And it is a partnership among um, the Center for Structural Equity, United Way of Delaware, Network Connect, and Minds in Motion. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Council Member Darby. Yes, thank you. Um, I also wanted to um, check to see um, last year in 2020, and I have forwarded two um, large requests for ARPA funding, one for the Wilmington Senior Center for $1.1 million and the FAME Center for $1.3 million. Are they on the list to get funded by ARPA? So I am not aware that, the, uh, that we have actually received those for review. Uh, if you have them, uh, if you forward them to me and Laura Najami and Director, I'm sorry, Chief of Staff Washington, we can get them reviewed as soon as possible. Yeah, I can get them sent over again because um, the organization sent them to everybody. So I'll re-forward the email that they sent to you guys. Um, but yeah, and my other question is too, if you can explain um, to the public um, who makes decisions on the final say on ARPA funding and how, where it gets spent and how much. Uh, so we received proposals. Uh, they are reviewed by uh, the mayor's office, the chief of staff and the mayor. Um, they are reviewed, then reviewed by law, our law department for ARPA eligibility. And uh, if they are ARPA eligible and approved, then uh, we develop a contract with the grantee. And then funding takes place from there after review from our compliance team. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to make it clear that it wasn't a legislative decision made, like there's not a vote, it's an executive branch decision. Thank you. All right, uh, Vice Chair Harley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question to you is, um, can you repeat uh, why Christina Culture Arts has not been distributed? Uh, so uh, they are still, they just need to be set up in our accounting system. Now, that is why they're not currently displaying on OpenGov. Uh, in order for a payment to go out, uh, that's actually kind of a separate process in itself. Uh, each grantee uh, needs to have a compliance uh, orientation meeting with our compliance team, which is UHY and Meridian. Uh, they explain all of our ARPA compliance requirements and then review any drawdown requests. Uh, I don't remember exactly how Christina Cultural Arts Center's um, uh, agreement is set up. Uh, I think that they are more than likely either, um, they might be set up on a reimbursement basis given that uh, the work they're doing is largely capital. Uh, so they will probably have repeated drawdown requests that are reviewed by our um, compliance team. So as soon as we receive the uh, a, um, an invoice that has been approved by our compliance team for ARPA eligibility and allowability and um, that all of their uh, reporting requirements have been communicated and are understood, then the invoice is um, uh, processed uh, through our accounting system and then the payment goes out. So as of yet, we have not yet received a, um, an approved invoice from them, um, but I will certainly follow up with our compliance team and ensure that they have met with them. I, I believe that they actually have so far since they're uh, kind of discussing um, you know, the work that will be done, but I'll ensure that that process is taking place. So who does the invoice come from again? Uh, the invoice will come from Christina Cultural Arts Center, uh, but they will need to have it reviewed by our compliance team first. 
as all invoices um, from any grantee need to be before they are paid. Okay, um, I hear what you're saying, but it's a little confusing because in one sense, it sounds like there is something on our end, meaning the administration's end, that needs to be completed. Mm -hmm. and, and But yet- uh, the, uh, yes. Go ahead. The, uh, the, project, the project and budget setup, it happens for every grantee. That is separate from the process of approving the invoice. One is not holding up the other currently. So are they aware that they need to submit an invoice because what, what, what is the invoice that they would be submitting since they already submitted a proposal and they're waiting for money to come from, from. Um... So, so they're essentially a construction project. Um, okay. So as I, as I recall, they're either purchasing a new building or they're renovating the one that they are currently doing. If okay. we were to say, um, pay all of the money out at once, they would just need to show that all of that work has been done. And then. Um, you know, that a certain amount of ARPA eligible work has been done, and then we would be able to issue the funds for that amount of work. So that's kind of what the compliance team does is they, they, because we can't necessarily, um, just because there's an agreement, we can't necessarily just give out the funds. It has to be in compliance with the contract that we have with them. So I don't know if we, either it was set up on a, um, a one-time payment or a reimbursement basis. And then it also, they need to fulfill the scope of work, in, which in this case would be actually doing the construction work. Understood. Uh, okay, so, so that uh, is, it is different. I agree by it being a capital project. I really do appreciate you explaining it. The only question I have for you, which is the last question, is the administration communicating with Christina Culture Arts Center specifically as to what is needed from them? Uh, so, uh, as soon as we, um, as soon as we approve a contract, and um, as soon as it has been signed by both parties, we automatically reach out and say our compliance team will be in touch with you. Uh, they will schedule an orientation meeting. I believe that our um, our compliance team has already met with Christina Cultural Arts Center, but I will follow up with this first thing tomorrow and ensure that they have met and that Christina Cultural Arts Center knows what needs to happen in order for this payment to happen as soon as possible. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate that thorough explanation. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much. I uh, would like to recognize uh, Council President Congo. Thank you for joining us. Um, did you have a, a question, Council President? No, I just wanted to be recognized. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we have Ms. Marshall Besnight from Council. Yes. Is there a question? Um Yes, just a question. Um, I know that the contract agreement has been signed for a cultural restoration project, as mm -hmm. well as for the Delaware Art Museum. So um, are their funds, are they set up as a construction project or is it more so a grant? And if so, will their funds, are their funds gonna be dispersed relatively soon? So uh, let's see here. So culture restoration, uh, that one, I will, uh, similar to Christina Cultural Arts Center, I will follow up with uh, our compliance team tomorrow, ensure that uh, they have had their compliant, their initial orientation meeting, and that if there is an invoice, um, that it is submitted to us as soon as possible so we can pay it. So I will follow up on that one tomorrow morning, similar to um, culture restoration. And Delaware Art Museum. So that one is a... Um, that one's actually a workforce development program. Uh, so in order for, uh, so similar, same as every other grantee, of course, they will have to have the orientation meeting with the compliance partners. But on top of that, um, I believe we would be paying that one on kind of a, I don't, without looking at the contract, I would assume that we would be paying that one on a reimbursement basis, um, given evidence that the program is actually taking place. Uh, so um, again, that is one I will follow up with on, uh, follow up with on tomorrow as well. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Chairman, if I can just yes, state um, one other thing is um, there was, you know, there was a request regarding the, um, the Wilmington Senior Center and regarding Fame Inc. So, I mean, I just want to state that those proposals were sent over to the administration. And I do know that both um, the mayor 
and Miss Washington have had reviewed both of those. So I just wanted just to share that for the record because I don't want anyone to think that proposals weren't already shared. So I do know that they have reviewed both of those. Okay. So that was the Wilmington Senior Center. And Fame Inc. And Fame Inc. Is that F-A-M-E? Yes. Okay. Alrighty. Uh, yes, I will. I'll check in with those tomorrow. If that's something that we can start reviewing through the law process, um, we'll make sure we do it so as soon as possible. And I just just want to clarify too. Is uh, never mind. I'm good. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, Miss Miss Murray, just again for the record, I just want to clarify. Um, just because a, a request comes from council, that does um, that does not mean it, it will actually be um, authorized by the administration. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, and especially uh, it, it's mostly dependent on the ARPA eligibility. Um, in addition to that, I would probably say uh, priorities and the amount left in a certain um, pot of money, but okay. um, that is certainly not a decision that I make. Okay, all right. Understood. Thank you. Um, we also have Council Member McCoy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to add, um, I do understand that portion about every request actually may not be granted, but will we receive uh, some notification on requests that we've actually sent out that will, uh, will not be able to be taken care of with the ARPA funds? Is that, you know, that, I don't believe that that's too much to ask. The, if we've actually sent the proposal and the grant request to let us know that it's actually will not be able to be, uh, we won't be able to receive that grant. Certainly, I, I definitely agree that that is a reasonable request. Uh, is there one that you are waiting on an answer for? Um, yeah, I am still waiting. Um, from what I understand, it's a much smaller uh, request. I think it's like $8,000, but- um, Oh, uh, that one we will actually, uh, I believe I know the one you were discussing. Yeah, and uh, yeah. From your, um, that would be from the city council allotment, correct? Yes. Uh, that one we will actually be discussing. I believe it is the fourth agenda item tonight. Okay. No, I was, I was just basically uh, following up on the chair. Just wanted to make certain that, especially as we've uh, actually put together like lists early on of the things of the uh, different nonprofits we would like to support, to be able to get back some feedback from administration would be great. Let us know whether or not they'll be able to fund certain grants. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Council Member Darby, floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to agree with Councilman um, McCoy in regards to giving a, um, letting us know if the proposal can't be granted. And I want to add the why, um, if it's ARPA, because they're not ARPA eligible, or is it because they just don't want to fund it? Um, because through this process, and everyone keeps saying it's keep throwing out this word like unity and that everyone's working together that's not true that is false only certain people get to go to the table to articulate and other people who try to make meetings are being excluded blocked from getting meetings with the mayor administration um and or it's taking a long time to get meetings to talk about things that advocate for my district um, but other people are just getting the money easily because they're in these meetings with the mayor administration frequently. And this is a executive branch decision on what gets paid. So I understand that because we don't have any power. We just have, um, we could just give recommendations and throw proposals and that's really it. Um, unless you're like friends with the mayor administration, um, you don't get, um, included in those conversations. Thank you. All right, um, and Vice Chair Harley. Vice Chair Harley. Sir, I was I was on me. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. I do want to mention that there is one point that we want to make sure that we're considering that when we first started talking about ARPA funds, um, city council members submitted names of organizations. And I know for a fact that for Christina Culture Arts Center, there were several people, several council members that supported Christina Culture Arts Center um, in terms of uh, submitting it to the executive branch. Um, uh, there was things that was just repeated 
um, that made me want to respond um, as it relates to how some of these organizations are getting approved. Some of them are getting approved because two, three, or four uh, other council members also included um, these organizations on their list. So for example, Christina Culture Arts Center was one where several council members put it on their list. Culture Restoration Project is another organization where several council members um, put this on their list. So I do know that that played into um, certain organizations getting uh, selected. In addition to some of these were also on the administration's um, list as well versus people having um, sidebar meetings or whatever uh, other kind of ways um, there may be out there as to how some of these organizations are getting selected. I just wanted to make sure that that is on a record that there is more than one, two, three, sometimes council members um, submitting some of the same names as to how some have been selected. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, and Ms. Mergler. Uh, yes, I, uh, I just also wanted to be um, clear that there is a, uh, there are the overall grants that are being approved um, through the ARPA process, but then there is also the 1.3 million that council set aside for councilmatic distribution. Um, council member McCoy, uh, the, uh, the project that you were mentioning earlier was part of that allotment. Um, and has been approved, but the um, we will be discussing an ordinance in relation to it um, as part of the fourth budget, um, the fourth uh, bullet for today's meeting. Thank you very much for the clarification, Ms. Mergler. Um, and I, I see you, Councilmember Darby, but first I'm gonna kick the members of the public if there's any uh, questions or comments regarding ARPA and the grant process. <clears throat> All right, seeing none, I'm gonna turn it back to now to council um, for any final uh, comments or questions. Uh, council member Darby's first. Yeah, sure. So I do wanna mention the 1.3 million that's divided amongst 13 people. So that's about $100,000 per person. Um, the two um, entities in my district who asked for money back in 2020, um, when they were first asking for ARPA proposals, one is asking for 1.1 million, 1 .1 million and others asking for 1.3 million. There's so much you can do with $100,000, right? Um, so I think we think like it's a lot of money because we say, oh, we gave council 1.3 million and you have at large people who have to use $100,000 for eight districts, right? Um, so I just think um, saying that it's unfair, like we have a lot of money, um, it's actually very little in um, what we can do, but we're gonna do what we can with 100. Um, and I actually really feel bad for the at-large because they have to figure out what to do with 100,000 um, between eight districts. Um, so I wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and Ms. Marler, again, thank you for standing in. I know Chief of Staff Washington is on vacation. So thank you very much for giving us the update. Um, again, um, I guess the... Uh, the announcement is always look at open uh, gov, gov uh, for the update. Um, and we look forward to having you back at the next finance committee meeting. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And now we'll turn to topic number two on the agenda, an update on the city's infrastructure fund project um, as it relates to the federal funds uh, that were just received from Washington, DC. Um, Ms. Mergler, are you speaking on this or is Commissioner Williams? Speaking on this? Uh, I will be speaking on this. Okay. All right. The, the floor is yours. All righty. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have much of an update. Uh, after following up with Commissioner Williams and Deputy Commissioner uh, Croce earlier, uh, we've determined we have not, since we have not yet uh, physically received any of the funds um, from the federal infrastructure bill, no spending has yet taken place. Um, but we will certainly keep you apprised of any updates. Okay, uh, now, Ms. Murler, do we know how much? I know it's always questioned back in May. We were not sure. We had to wait for the state allotment. Do we have an estimate of how much of the infrastructure bill will get to trickle down to us? 
Uh, I believe the estimate is um, currently 23 million, um, which would be spent on existing capital projects, but that is not final on any level. Um, I know that we, um, we have submitted certain amounts for drinking water and clean water projects, but those full applications are still being worked on and must be approved before any project receives funding. Um, could any funds potentially be used for uh, some programs such as uh, sidewalk and uh, road repair projects as well? Absolutely. In fact, the 23 million, I believe, will be spent largely on uh, transportation projects. Okay. All right. Um, do we expect by August we'll have an update as to when the actual, well, I guess, let me strike that. Um, it will be similar to the same process we filed for ARPA, but we'll need to do, I guess, a resolution approving the grant funds. Is that the way it's going to work? I think it might be more similar to um, when we approve, uh, according per my conversation with Commissioner Williams earlier, uh, it sounds like the funds will actually be administered by the state of Delaware uh, through the state revolving fund. So this will be a little bit more similar to when we receive um, state revolving funds for our existing capital projects. Okay. All right. All right, thank you very much. Um, and I'll jump first to, to Ms. Bass Knight from Council. Yeah, um, yeah, just one, one question is, I mean, at our last meeting, we asked for a list of the shovel ready projects that could perhaps make up that 23 million. So um, do you know whether Commissioner Williams, I mean, if that has been determined yet, so council can have, have some type of idea of what some of those projects are um, that would be helpful for council um thank you so uh commissioner williams uh said they will be used on existing projects in the capital budget so essentially this would uh, supplant um bond funding so say instead of uh for the next bond issuance the uh for the 22 projects um we would use this funding instead uh that is all i know so far but i can certainly have her provide a list Yes, so we, we need an actual list because there are a ton of capital projects out there. So we want to know which ones it is so we can have um, an idea, please. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Harley. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Bass Knight sort of asked the question that I had, but I, I still want to piggyback off of what she said. So one, these projects that you mentioned um, are going to be covered with this uh, 23 million. Were these projects started before we learned about the infrastructure funding? Uh, so typically they are ongoing projects uh, in the capital program. Uh, so I don't think that it would necessarily it would be an, after we received the funding, I think it would have to be an accounting question of whether or not we supplant the funding we've already supplied for certain projects, or we just use it for money, go, you know, for projects going forward. So say for unfunded projects in the 22 capital budget. So in the 22 capital budget, there's typically projects that we submit for every capital budget, which are, you know, street paving, mm -hmm. um, sidewalk, that sort of thing. So that would be um, the street paving for the 22 budget. If um, So it, it's that, it's those sorts of activities, not necessarily mm -hmm. the specific actions, if that makes any okay. sense. Okay. Yeah. No, you, you answered my question. And as it relates to Ms. Bass and I's question, um, that's very important for us to fully understand, you know, what projects are being funded because as council members, we need to know, is there going to be any money left over, you know, once these projects have been identified? So we don't want to start thinking about um, projects within our districts um, as it relates to these dollars, if they're already taken. So I think us having a um, list of these projects associated, you know, with the dollar amount that will give us some idea as to 
what we can possibly start thinking about doing within our in our districts within the community. So, Certainly. so I agree with Ms. Bass, like, and hopefully we can get the list as as you know as soon as possible. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. All right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, is there any comments or questions from members of the public? Any public comment about infrastructure fund? All right, seeing none, I'm gonna kick it back to council for any final comments or questions. All right, um, thank you very much, Ms. Margler. Again, similar to the uh, standard ARPA, uh, we'll look forward to having some, hopefully some more updates next month, uh, specifically from Commissioner Williams, if possible, just so we can have a, a exact breakdown of the infrastructure project, or at least an idea of what we're looking at, okay? Certainly. Um, so that's something the committee would like next month. Um, Certainly. All right. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, now turning to agenda item number three. Um, this is a substitute ordinance to ordinance 21-24, the ordinance to amend chapter five of the, Delaware, of the city code to require buyers of residential property to uh, have a business license. I believe the um, prime sponsor is uh, Council Member Darby. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, so this piece of legislation is um, to, it's a one tool to use to increase the number of business licenses that rental property, um, that rental property owners have. So at um, property settlement, when they're buying a home and there would be a sheet that they check off that says vacant for a while, and then it goes to the city. And if they check off that it's a rental unit, a check is cut um, from the settlement, at settlement, for business license. Um, and then those new landlords from the city of Wilmington will get a welcome packet on what it means to be a landlord in the city of Wilmington. So this is one way of capturing um, business license um, in the city of Wilmington, which we know that is an issue. There are landlords um, throughout our city who are operating as a business without the proper business license. Um, so this is just one way and one pro I had several meetings almost, wow, like a year, almost like a year now, uh, talking to community members, um, talking to um, different departments, um, in, uh, like Brett, and meetings with him about the piece of legislation. Um, we had some meetings with the Real Estate Agents um, Association. So, um, so yeah, I'll leave it open for any comments or questions. Okay. Um, I guess first off, thank you very much, Councilmember Darby. I know you you've mentioned this before, um, and you've introduced this and then made some changes. Um, and. Uh, at this time, is this something, uh, and this is specific a question regarding the, the enforcement end. Um, so at the property settlement, um, what oversight does the city have, or is this something that would just get added into the settlement docs? Yes, yeah, so it would be a new form that is created, a new process. Okay, all right, all right, thank you. All right. Um, that was the only question I had. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice Chair Harley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You pretty much asked the same question I was going to ask um, as it relates to who's really reinforcing um, this process. Because when you think about when you go to closing, um, usually the city, I, I, you know, I, I, I was just trying to. Well, first of all, let me say I think that the, the concept is a, a good one and this is a great legislation so let me just say that but the only thing i was trying to understand in my head was who is going to reinforce it because when you think about the city versus you know when an individual is actually going to settlement or you saying that this document is going to be a, a part of the clo the closing documents council member darby Hello? Yes, council member. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Do that, that was, hear me? Um, it's kind of choppy, but if you could repeat 
if you said something, could you repeat it? Excuse me, W I C N. Uh, uh, Council Member Darby is, is really chopped right now. I don't know if W I T N can do something on their end. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Now clear. Okay. Yeah, I cut on. I was on my cellular data. I just went to Wi-Fi. But um, I was saying yes. It is a document that will already be the closing settlement paperwork. And who is going to be responsible for implementing that? Did you do you know who's going to be responsible for that? Yes, there are people who are willing to work with the city to create the document. And then once it's created, um, kind of disperse it out to the real estate community. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Um, now I'm going to kick it to members of the public for any. Uh, comment. I do see a member of the public has their hand raised, a uh, Miss Renee Asparel. Uh, Miss Burrell? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, the floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Renee Sproul. I am a real estate agent within the state. Um, I've probably met a lot of you before <laughs> working on various uh, different ordinances that have come up, but I've been working with Councilwoman Darby over the past year in regards to this idea that came up a couple years ago when um, a lot of the legislation regarding landlords and taking better care of properties was kind of on the agenda. Um, I had mentioned this before and Councilwoman Darby has uh, reached out to me to help develop this idea, but she did summarize it very well. And, you know, to kind of add a little bit of clarification to Council. Councilman Johnson and Councilwoman Harley's question regarding how it would be implemented. Um, I volunteered as well as a member of the Delaware Bar Association has volunteered to help put together the document that would be distributed to all the settlement attorneys. And similar to a document that the state already sends out to collect revenue from out-of-state owners who sell properties to ensure that the state of Delaware collects their proper, their income tax this document will be included in a very similar fashion. So when an attorney is notified that when an attorney finds that their settlement is for a property in Wilmington, they will send out what is in essence an affidavit to the buyer asking them very specific questions about how the property would be used. If they check off that the property will be an investment property or a rental property, then at that point, the settlement attorney will take further action to determine, is this an active rental? And if so, have them complete the rental application prior to settlement so that, they, so that they know how much to collect and put onto the settlement sheet. Or if they say it's a vacant property and they're not sure how it's gonna be used, they won't collect anything, but they would forward that information to license and inspections. But it, so that LNI is aware that a vacant property um, is going to be sold into the inventory. And whoever's in charge of the vacant property monitoring within license and inspection now has that address and they can monitor it. So in, in essence, this legislation will not only help um, increase registration for rental properties, but also give LNI a heads up on vacant properties so they can monitor those and make sure either something happens with them or that they start to pay those vacant property fees after the allotted time period is passed. Um, so I just want to add a little bit more light on that. I think it'd be very helpful um, and hopefully council uh, will support it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, th th thank you very much, Ms. Uh Burrell, uh, I'm looking and don't see any other uh, comments by members of the uh, public, so I'll turn it back to members of council. Um, and I do want to, again, just for the record, I, I, I want, um, given I know this has been a, a long um, piece in, in, in the works, uh, it's a very good piece of legislation. I believe it needs uh, the full back in the finance committee. So I, I will be uh, adding myself as a co-sponsor. Uh, I would like to be added as a co-sponsor. Um, it is time now. I'll kick it to uh, Council President. Yes, thank you. I would just like to be added as a co-sponsor. Okay. All right. So noted. Um, Ms. Bass Knight. Yes, and I just wanted just to state for the record too, um, with this legislation, it, it becomes effective after one year. Um, just want to mention that so that everyone is aware. Excellent. So, um, so if it, as soon as the council meeting, it would be passed. It would be the effective date would be one year from the passage, correct? 
Miss Miss Bath Knight. Yes, from the date uh, um, the mayor signs the legislation. Okay, gotcha. All right. Um, any other uh, question or comment on uh, substitute one to ordinance twenty one dash twenty four? All right. Um, and because this is an ordinance, it does need to be formally voted out of committee. Um, so at this time, I will entertain a motion to um, pass order substitute one to ordinance twenty one dash twenty four. Um, from committee to full council for a vote. So move. Is there a second? Aye. All right. It's been properly moved and seconded. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Well, the ayes have it um, by voice vote. And uh, substitute one to ordinance 21 24 will be on the full council agenda. Um, do we have a date yet, Marshall? Yes, August the 18th. Okay. 18. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Darby. Um, and now I'll turn to item number four on the agenda. It is a resolution establishing the City Council uh, Task Force to review fines, fees, and administrative sanctions to the city. Um, this is a resolution. I believe the uh, uh, primary sponsor is Councilmember Darby. The floor is yours. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So this Legislate or uh, resolution is to establish a task force that will um, take a look at all fees and fines that the city of Wilmington um, that they assess. Um, and part of the reason is just to make sure that our fees and fines are equitable um, <clears throat> and that they make sense in the practices that go along with it. Um, does it make sense to tow someone's car and then after a certain period of time? They're not able to pay for their fees and fines. And then the tow company gets to keep their car indefinitely. And then you still owe the fees and fines. So looking at what's fair, what is equitable in the process and what fees and fines are given um, to individuals. The city of Wilmington is also in the process of applying to the national fees and fines um, program. It will be, hopefully will be in the second cohort um, where we'll be with other cities throughout the country to work on fee and fine reform with experts, researchers across the country to look at our city and figure out what fees and fines, um, how we can do fee and fine reform for our city. Also, of course, looking at our revenue. What does that mean? How would it be impacted? Those things with experts looking at it. So the fees and fines task force, if we get accepted to the program, we'll kind of work hand in hand together um, on making sure that um, we are looking at fee and fine reform in our city and that we have the backing and support of national, of experts, of researchers, helping us collect the data that we need to be able to say um, whatever we wanna say about fee and fine reform for the city of Wilmington, right? Um, so I don't know if anyone has any questions or thoughts, but that is like the premise of it. Um Yes, yes, Council Member Dar. I, I do have a, a question just on the point of uh, debtor's prison um, uh, as something I've worked, I, I, I was a board member of Delaware Center for Justice and, we, we, and we've you know, worked on this issue for a long time as well. Um, is there any thought to having the cohort work at the state level? Um, because from my understanding, a lot of the hefty fee, 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 fines and fees, especially um, you know, due to like citations, Mm -hmm. or misdemeanors, those are at the state level. So it's the idea to kind of marry the two, because I understand in the city we have some part, but it really a lot of them are at the state level where they're getting KPSs and ended up back in the prison system. That's a huge problem as well. Right, no, I, I get what you're saying on focusing on the state level. However, this program is specifically for cities and counties, right? So they're not looking for um, state to work with more cities and counties. So all, their first cohort were full of cities and counties. So they're only really looking to work with the city of Wilmington. However, on the team that we have applying um, for the fees and fines program, we have debtors in prison, um, that group um, who, who's a part of it because we understand that some of the things that we're gonna do on a city level, we need state support. So we're able to do that, but it can't be a state focus. It has to be a city focus, because that's like the, requirements of the program okay all right all right thank you for the clarification um all right and i see oh we have uh director brett taylor from department of finance is there a question or comment uh just one um 
one comment is that the administration over the last year has been looking at its fees and fines. Um, we would be happy to engage in some conversation with city council, uh, only in that um, we don't want to recreate the wheel with respect to what those, um, you know, where those fees and fines are. Um, we haven't, uh, we haven't really um, uh, come become have it come out in public yet uh, in terms of what we're what we have found. So what I think we should do is really have a conversation uh, prior to any kind of kickoff for the, just so that there is no duplication of effort here. May I respond? Oh. Uh, yes, 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 council member. Yes, yes. So the task force that's gonna be established um, has um, city departments on there. So the finance department. So it will have, we will have input, not just from community members, but the task force is community members, elected officials and um, departments. I think it's um, finance department. I think we include the LNI. So it's going to be a conversation of all the stakeholders at the table to have this together. So it's not going to be a separate conversation. We're definitely going to engage the finance department and the task force. And when we I'm going to speak it into existence when we get accepted to the National Fees and Fines Program, um, definitely including the finance department. Um, so you will be included in all those conversations. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Field, I believe your hand was up first. Yes. I, I want to thank Council Member Darby for her focus on this issue. M my comment, though, is that, I mean, we have several people here that work for the city, very smart people, city residents that are focusing quite closely on this issue and share these concerns. And they are dedicating a significant amount of time to this issue. So they're here. They're working on it. Let's have this conversation, city residents, city council members, city employees, let's have it. And I think that's, I'm skeptical of the need for a task force because we're already doing this work and we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Thank you very much. Uh, council member Spadola. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My thought on reading this um, was more so, more than even a task force. It almost should be a uh, a permanent subcommittee of the uh, of the finance committee because when we're talking about fines and fees, um, you know, the city has budgeted for some of the fines and fees as revenue. So if if we're we need to look at that holistically and not in a vacuum, um, you know, if we're looking at bringing down the parking ticket fine, which I know we've spoken about, the next question has to be, um, well, how are we going to offset that revenue loss? And so that I, I think it's super important that it's really lives within the finance committee so we can have that holistic uh, view of everything and not just in a vacuum. So I, if we could make that change, I would be much more inclined to support it uh, when it gets to a council meeting. Thank you. <laughs> My service went completely out, so I don't know what Nathan uh, said, and I just heard the end of what you said, Council Member Spadola, but I'm willing to listen. Okay. All right. Very well. Um, I'll Vice Chair Harley. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> when I looked at the composition of the task force, were these recommendations by this this um uh, organization, Council Member Darby, or how did that come about? Because when, when I look at the composition of the um, the different, uh, what I want to say, like finance department, I mean, has there been buy-in? Um, how, I mean, yeah, I'm just trying to understand, did you get buy-in from individuals, for example, the finance department, public works, or are you making these recommendations? Because I'm thinking that based on what we're trying to accomplish here, it would bode well to try to build the relationships 
to make sure that people, individuals, you know, want to be represented. Um, because I think that this can happen two ways. You can identify particular um, individuals based on their role. And there's also an opportunity to open it up for individuals that are just interested. So I'm just speaking specifically right now to the composition of what I noticed when I was reading who is going to make up this task force, especially where it says that whoever the district person is, which is one, one district person, and the district person will become the, uh, the chairperson of the task force versus, you know, in this case, you're the one that's sponsoring this legislation and, you know, having this um, desire to take it to this level, I would think that you, you know, maybe you would be considering yourself to be the, 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 the chairperson of the task force versus, I, I didn't even understand the connection of the person from the district being the chairperson of the task force. But since this is the first and second reading, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm, I'm correct, there's an opportunity for, for us to talk about this more uh, possibly offline, I guess. I don't know. But you can respond, Councilmember Darby. Yeah, so I've reached out to you and Councilmember Kabir about this several times. So mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. is the first time, like, I, like you can't deny that. No, um, I'm not trying to. Okay, all right. So <laughs> like, that's like new what I'm hearing right now. So, but I am willing to have conversations as I have been with you guys trying to engage you to look at the legislation and give me feedback. And then we wait tonight while I'm at the finance committee meeting to give that feedback when you could have given me that several times that I've been asking over the last few months for feedback. But I'm open um, <laughs> to making adjustments and amendments. Um, the committee selections um, is one recommendation. So the fees and fines program gives multiple ways that you could set up a committee. There's not a one way set in stone way of doing it. So I'm not bought to any way of setting up the um, commission long as it's um, community people on there like there are certain things I'm like we got to make sure we have it on there but I am not bought to the um, composition because it's flexible and I also have been reaching out to council people for feedback and support on this piece of legislation and I haven't really received any thank you so thank you for your response council member Darby so me asking the question was not a critique at all I mainly really was trying to understand from the uh, from the administration side and you, you you have been sending out emails and and I'm not denying that at all. I was basically thinking more about when I read public works and I read the finance, you know, some of these other um these other individuals from the executive branch. I was trying to understand was there already some conversation with them? more so than the council members, in addition to, you know, maybe some of the other questions. So that was really the big question that I really had. Because uh, Mr. Taylor, Director Taylor didn't seem to, I don't, I don't know, uh, w w you know, when he responded, I was just curious to know if, if there has been some buying in from, from the executive branch to be on a task force, that's the bottom line. That's the question. Yes. Um, so I have reached out to the mayor administration several times <clears throat> to talk about the fees and fines national program to get support. And um, I have been ignored. So <laughs> at this point, I have to move forward with my legislation. I have reached out. I have tried. Um, and that's all I can do. Understood. Understood. OK, thank you. You answered my question. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you very much. All right, um, I'm now turning it to members of the public for any comments or questions, uh, comments. Um, I do see a member of the public with their hand raised. Um, that's a, uh, a Lynn Kielhorn. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, the floor is yours. Thank you. So yes, I'm Lynn Keelhorn, and I'm the co-lead of the of Delaware's campaign to end debtors prison. 
which has been primarily focused on fines and fees issues at the state level, but also is supportive of understanding and improving how they work at the municipal and other levels as well. Um, we strongly support this resolution and, and believe that um, creating the task force is very worthwhile to provide a framework and structure to the conversations that need to be um, had. And I appreciate uh, Director Taylor saying that there are conversations um, happening already. So we're very interested to learn what all um, you know, data has already been prepared and sliced and diced and would love to dive into that. And if conversations can start before um, the task force is formally um, put into place, that would be great. There's no reason to not start informal conversations. But I think having the formal structure of the task force um, would be very beneficial and help make sure that all of the appropriate folks are included and invited to the table um, to move forward. Um, so I just wanted to endorse this to move forward. That's all, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, now turning it to members of council for any final comments or questions. All right, um, oh, sorry, that must've been, uh, we, we do have a member of the public um, I, I, and I just missed them, Gabrielle Alantieri. Hey, are, 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 it's Gabby from Westside Grows. Hi, everybody. Um, so I was asked to just um, sit in on this meeting because I believe that we were going to discuss the use of a lot on 4th Street, but I don't know if that made it onto the agenda. I think uh, it was the yeah, last. Yeah. Yes, yes, Gabby, it is. It is on the agenda. It hasn't come up yet. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> no problem. All right. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much. Um, any final call for uh, comment on this this piece of legislation? All right. Um, if there are none, I'm kicking it to council for any final comments or questions. All right. I'm saying none since this is a resolution. It does not uh, need to get. Uh, not need to be voted out of committee and it will be placed on the next available agenda or a subsequent agenda um, when, when when a sponsor is ready. Thank you. All right, uh, now turning to agenda item number five. This is ordinance 22-31, an ordinance to create a temporary city council special fund for community support grants for entities impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I. I am the um, prime sponsor on this. I will speak briefly and then turn over to administration. Um, this is a housekeeping uh, sort of amendment um, in which we made uh, a few changes in order for us to be able to process some of the ARP grant, the, the, the micro ARP grant funds from city council's allotment um, so we can get them out the door a little sooner and faster. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Mergler. Uh, thank you, Council Chair. So, as you are aware, uh, 1.3 million in ARPA funds has been allocated for councilmanic distribution to nonprofits impacted by COVID-19. This ordinance will create a temporary special fund in City Council to house this 1.3 million, and thus allow City Council to directly administrate its own grants. Uh, the funds will be transferred from the tax stabilization reserve portion of the grant of the general fund balance. The funds being transferred represent a commensurate portion of the 12 million in ARPA funds allocated for revenue replacement in the FY23 budget. Allocating the funds from the revenue replacement will eliminate the stringent ARPA compliance requirements uh, that I described earlier that are uh, imposed by the U.S. Treasury for ARPA grants, uh, thus ensuring that our administrative costs in relation to compliance remain low, and also helping to alleviate the significant burden that ARPA compliance place it would place on small nonprofits while ensuring that they receive the funds as quickly and efficiently as possible. Okay, so um, to just kind of break it down, Ms. Murgler, essentially, and, and, and I want to try to summarize this a lot easier for the public. So essentially, um, was more money added to revenue replacement and then 
that offsetting dollars then is going to be used to fund the um, the grant kind of pool instead of using ARPA funds. Is that kind of essentially what's what's going on? Yes, that is correct. Uh, now, granted, the additional 1.3 million in revenue replacement will need to be part of the FY22 budget. I mean, FY24 budget process. Uh, but yes, uh, essentially, this will replace or add to our revenue replacement in general. Okay, got it. All right. Um, and so what would the parameters be around this $1.3 million fund? Will it be similar to the community support funds that council already has, or do we Correct. need to establish uh, regs? Yeah, Mr. Uh, Chairman, if I can speak to that. Um, so, um, okay. that one, yeah, so basically um, that 1.3 million that will um, be utilized based upon our um, existing community support funds and um, discretionary um, funds policies that we have set up in city council. Um, the one caveat with this is any um, organization that's granted funds over 5,000 or more, um, that will not require a resolution to come before council. Um, that is clarified in this particular um, ordinance. Um, I just want to mention that for the record. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Bass Knight. Um, and was there anything further, Ms. Ms. Mergler, on an administration standpoint? Uh, no. I think we have some questions, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. I'll now turn to uh, council as they may have some questions for you, Ms. Mergler. Uh, first, council uh, member Spadola. Thank you. I'm curious how, you know, we're, we're getting this money from the Fed. We got this money from the Feds with very specific guidelines on how we can use it. So how do we have the authority to then, uh, you know, basically say, by doing this, we're essentially exempting ourselves from ARPA guidelines, it seems. And I just don't understand how that would be legal. Uh, it has to be through revenue replacement. So uh, there are very few restrictions placed on what you can do with money that you designate as revenue replacement. Uh, tip, uh, we had decided to allocate 12 million um, to cover our losses from the pandemic. Uh, if we actually, applied the uh, the formula that the feds give us for revenue replacement it allows us to cover even more than just our losses and once you do that uh, you can spend the funds much more freely than uh, you could if you were spending it as a specific ARPA allocation um, the only restrictions placed on revenue replacement are in relation, you can't put it into a pension fund, um, you can't use it to issue tax refunds. Uh, there were a couple others. Um, you can't use it to offset uh, sale of investments or utility income, that sort of thing. But in general, it can be used on mostly anything you would like. Uh, the reason we're not doing it for everything is we want to try and spend the money as close to the letter of the law as possible um, in order to you know prevent any potential audit concerns the issue we were running into with the city council grants is because of their smaller size uh if if we ended up having say if all of this ended up being micro grants uh, we would be looking at about maybe 150 grants, and those still have exactly the same ARPA compliance. So it's a lot of burden on somebody to say only get a couple thousand dollars. Um, there's a lot of back and forth involved um, as well that takes time since you have to come up with a contract first, et cetera. So over time, our compliance team would still have to spend the same amount of time on a grant for, say, $8,000 as they would for one that's a million dollars. And that would eventually end up tripling or more our administrative costs for compliance. So we wanted to keep those costs low. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to make sure that city council could spend these grants expediently and on the things that you actually are passionate about and care about in the community and are less worried about making sure you meet these very stringent ARPA compliance um, requirements. Okay, I mean, as long um, it sounds like it's been vetted, so. Thank you. Yes, and it has also been vetted by our compliance team, um, the people who tell us whether or not we're uh, spending the money correctly. So they have they actually um, recommended that we take this step. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, 
And actually, I, I see someone from law department is present. Uh, is, is the attorney from law department just able to, um, since this is a little unique, is anyone from law department able to just give some brief insight? Hello, Council Member Johnson. Um, so I can, uh, there's there's a few different components to this. First, um, the ARPA regulations, both interim final rule and the final rule, both envision that cities have the option to add to the revenue because they lost revenue during the pandemic. And that revenue replacement process, once the money is in the revenue, barring the few items that Ms. Mergler mentioned, such as a legal settlement, such as a pension plan, such as a tax offset, um, it can be used as a city would normally use it as part of its revenue, including in this case, as the city normally has council members make grants within the community. So this is specifically envisioned in the process. And as Ms. Margot confirmed, um, the, it's a better option, we think, for the community because the cost of having each of the individual organizations receiving these grants, having them go through the entire SAM.gov process, having them go through the entire monitoring and compliance process. It's extremely onerous to go through the ARPA process. Um, and this would allow them to spend a lot more money in the community rather than have to work through the extensive ARPA process. And we're following exactly the, regu the regu uh, regulations that were envisioned um, and allowed in the final rule. And we have com confirmation from our outside compliance uh, specialists who are also preparing the city for an outside audit that this is completely allowable. So not just the law department is in agreement, but also our auditing specialists. Right, thank you very much. Uh, and, and I think that provides some clarification. Um, so thank you. Uh, I believe we have uh, Council Member McCoy, question or comment? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I am so glad that you were able to come to this conclusion. Uh, I have to state that $8,000, which seems small at the moment, at the time when I made this request, we were only getting like 20 something thousand a piece. So that was actually a much more substantial amount of the funds that I had. And, you know, then later we actually were uh, more was added. So my question is actually, do our do we have the same time period as our regular fiscal year when it comes to our discretionary funds? This is a lot more money and wanted to know whether or not we are expected to have uh, to find these nonprofits in one fiscal year. No. Okay. So uh, the, the beauty of setting this up in a special fund means it will be a revolving year. So the funds, if, if they're not expended by the end of FY23, they will carry over until FY24, 25 until they are fully expended. Okay. Thank you. And, and, and Ms. Mergler or, uh, or Ms. Nahemi from law department maybe can answer this question. So if this does pass, um, when's as soon as we can get out some checks? Because I believe we do have a backlog. I know uh, Council Member McCoy, uh, Council Member Oliver, a few other council members already have some agencies that we've made commitments to. Um, how soon could a check be out the door? Uh -huh. Uh, let's see. So essentially, uh, as soon as the as soon as the ordinance passes, uh, the finance department will just need to do a journal entry that transfers money from the um, from the tax stabilization reserve into the special fund. Um, we can even do some of the work on the back end before the ordinance passes, just to be safe to have the um, the uh, the actual fund in place so that that transfer can happen as soon as possible. And then once it does, the funds will be available and then the grants can be made um, just the same as they are from your discretionary funds. Uh, the city does make uh, check runs once a week um, unless it's a special request. Uh, so um, those go out on Tuesday. Uh, and if it's a... Um, if we have everybody's direct deposit information, it can go out and be received by Thursday. Otherwise, it would be a check that would be mailed out. All right. Thank you very much for the clarification, Ms. Margola. Um, thank you very much again for the law department for assisting as well. Um, since this is an ordinance, it does need to be technically voted by committee. Uh, so at this time, I will entertain a motion to move ordinance 22-31 uh, uh, out of committee to full council for a vote. So moved. 
There's a second. Second. All right. It's been properly moved and seconded. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? All right. All right. The ayes have it by voice vote and uh, order 22-31 will be on the full council agenda. Um, will it be on this Thursday, um, this past night? Yes, it will, Chairman. Okay. Because I knew it was kind of an emergency. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much. It will be on the council agenda this Thursday, the uh, 14th. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on to the next agenda item, number six. There is uh, this is ordinance 22 30 in order to improve the disposition of seven properties located west center city to graduate as a jump start Wilmington program. Uh, I believe uh, there is uh, the, the prime sponsor, um, Ms. Brigitte Fields, is here, and then also I believe we have uh, real estate and housing director Bob Ware. Uh, so, first, I'll hand it to you, uh, Council Member Fields, and then you can do the um, I guess the first comment. Okay, thank you, Councilman um, Johnson. And Johnson, um, I just wanted to say, well, we do have uh, we have someone on here from Sanir, which is um, Miss uh, Deanna Sargent, and we do have the Director of Real Estate and Housing. But this program is going to benefit the community um, as well as those minority developers um, that's coming in the West Center City, um, and they are just. Um, and I hope everyone sees that this is a beneficial. Um, ordinance that will help um, not just West Center City, but um, the entire city of Wilmington, if we can continue with this program and it continues to grow. So with that being said, I'm going to ask um, Director Weir to, um, to speak to this or ordinance. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, thank you, Chairperson Johnson and members of City Council. Uh, this initiative is really a cooperative initiative. Uh, it's between the city, the land bank, the Wilmington Housing Authority, and Jumpstart Wilmington. Uh, the purpose, as the council member had uh, discussed just briefly, is to uh, connect local emerging developers. And those developers have made a commitment to learn more about uh, community development here in our city. Um, and we're trying to provide a su sustainable process that will result in more vacant homes being occupied. Uh, we have total confidence that uh, the number of properties that uh, are being offered uh, will be renovated in a short turnaround and will be available um, primarily for home ownership. But uh, these properties have had HUD monies invested in them. So during the pandemic, we had stripped these properties out, removed any environmental hazards and put new roofs on them. Uh, the HUD requirements that uh, they are providing housing for um, income qualified uh, individuals and families uh, that it must be done so that uh, the city has the, will have the ability and right to call the properties back if it's, if promises made are not kept. And, uh, and again, I talk about homeownership as being our priority, but I want to be transparent in that uh, if after a, a number of months, they are not, um, we, a buyer is not found uh, that we do have uh, the ability to allow the owners to rent these out again to income qualified individuals and families, but uh, rather than just staying vacant. So the homeownership is our first priority uh, in this particular uh, initiative uh, and the federal requirements of the HUD funds that have been invested in them will go forward with them. And uh, we think that this is the start of something that can be sustainable and can uh, put another tool in our uh, toolbox to take vacant properties and have them occupied again in our city. Thank you. Um, I had a, had a, a question, Dr. Weir. Um, so I do understand that home ownership is the priority, um, but is, is rental renting an option um, so that it could add to the city's rental stock, you know, as we hear every day about the severe lack of affordable rental housing in, in the city. Um, is that a possibility or is it restricted by HUD and guidelines that it has to be home owner property? The uh, direct answer is that it's not restricted. Uh, we would set the uh, documentation up and the promises that uh, there would be a priority for home ownership. And that would be the, that would predicate the de development pro forma that they would sell those properties. Uh, however, 
We know that there is a need. Our vacancy rate is very low in our affordable marketplace as far as rental. And also that when we talk about some of the locations of these properties, uh, they might be a difficult uh, homeownership uh, opportunity for, uh, in, the, in the present. So uh, what we're really looking at is making it flexible. Uh, we would have it predetermined as far as, uh, you know, is it 60 days that it needs to be on the market? And at that point, they would have to come back and in writing request that the properties would be either flipped uh, at that point for a rental or continue to be the same owner and uh, be rented out. And, and, and the file director, where, where uh, is it possible uh, as we look to get Jumpstart Wilmington kind of going in the city? Um, is they, are we able to look at other neighborhoods, especially on the uh, west side, you know, for example, Hilltop, um, some other much needed areas? Uh, we have some areas, of course, on the east side as well. Um, is, is, is this program able to be expanded and, and kind of replicated through other parts? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that is really the vision. Uh, when we are talking about um, our partnership right now with the land bank, with WHA, that is exactly where this is going. And that right now there are uh, eight properties that are in West Center City. And we think there's some dynamics that are very positive to have eight properties in West Center City being done at one time. The housing authority is looking in the hilltop area. And of course, the land bank has properties that are um, spread throughout the city. Uh, so we're trying to uh, put together something that's sustainable that we are gonna ask these folks to go through the process that was normally followed by the land bank uh, for disposition. And that's uh, also to create the competitive um, atmosphere that they're going to need to get better at. Uh, and then the housing authority has the same uh, idea. So this cooperation uh, is really, we hope, just the starter of, of the uh, process and uh, we can see this happening all over the city. All right, thank you very much, Director Weir. Um... Don't see any questions or comments from council at this time. So I'm going to kick it to members of the public. Is there any comments or questions uh, or comments by members of the public? Okay, no. There was an individual from Sinair, uh, I believe council member Field said. Is, is that individual here? Uh, uh, a, a council member Field? Yes, that's what I was going to uh, mention. Okay. Um, Ms., um, I wanted Ms. Sargent to speak to the Jumpstart program um, and just give a uh, city council. Okay, council member feels a Wi Fi uh, broke up. Are you, are you back Can you on? hear me? Yes. I, I, I believe you said you had someone from Sanair. Yes, I just want her to speak to the Jumpstart program. She's on, Deanna Sargent. Okay, Ms. Sargent, yes, I do see her. Uh, okay, the uh, floor is yours, Ms. Sergeant. Thank you. I'll try to be very brief with my remarks. Good evening, Chairman Johnson, Vice Chair Harley, and members of the Finance and Economic Development Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on Ordinance 22-030, which is an ordinance to dispose of seven properties owned by the City of Wilmington to graduates of the Jumpstart Wilmington program. My name is Deanna Sargent and I am Vice President of Community Development for Sinair, a nonprofit organization that provides lending to developers to create affordable housing for rental or home ownership, including multifamily low-income housing tax credit projects. Additionally, we provide lending to support the development of community facilities that will bring resources and services to low and moderate income communities. In October 2020, we launched the Jumpstart Wilmington program based on an express need by local community-based organizations, development entities, and other stakeholders. The overall purpose of the program is to promote the growth of local developers through training and development to support neighborhood revitalization and community development solutions by providing aspiring developers with the skills, knowledge, and support they need to rehabilitate properties. With over 1,500 vacant and blighted units in the city, increased developer capacity is needed to address this issue, and we believe that helping to create small-scale developers will be the key to creating the scale needed to effectively revitalize Wilmington neighborhoods. 
Jumpstart Wilmington is modeled after Jumpstart Germantown, which launched in Philadelphia over seven years ago with the goal of equipping people ideally from the community with the resources to develop their community and increasing developer capacity. Another goal is to increase the amount of black and brown developers as well as women developers. Just a bit of demographic context, our Jumpstart Wilmington graduate composition to date is approximately 65% women, 35% men, 80% people of color with people predominantly identifying as black or African American at about 70%, and 70% have indicated they are Wilmington residents. A critical piece of ensuring the success of the program and the goals we are trying to achieve with revitalizing vacant property in Wilmington is to have properties available for our Jumpstart Wilmington small scale developers to acquire for redevelopment. The seven properties in this ordinance will be part of the Jumpstart Wilmington Property Acquisition Pilot Program, which is a partnership between the city, Wilmington Land Bank, and the Wilmington Housing Authority's nonprofit entity, the Delaware Affordable Housing Group. The property acquisition pilot program will consist of a total of 12 properties that will be made available for our Jumpstart Wilmington graduates to acquire and develop, seven of which will hopefully be provided by the city of Wilmington through this, this disposition process, and the remaining five will be provided by the Wilmington Housing Authority's Delaware Affordable Housing Group. The city's seven properties will be developed as affordable home ownership housing for households at or below 80% area median income. The Wilmington Housing Authority's Delaware Affordable Housing Group properties will be developed as rental for households at or below 80% area median income. WHA is also willing to provide housing vouchers if needed for the properties they are contributing to the Jumpstart Wilmington Property Acquisition Pilot Program. With the need for affordable housing options throughout the city and the country, quite frankly, this is an opportunity to help generate affordable housing utilizing small scale community focused developer capacity we are building through the Jumpstart Wilmington program. We ask for your support of this ordinance and hope to see successful outcomes that will allow us to create these property acquisition opportunities for our Jumpstart Wilmington graduates on a greater scale throughout the city and all of your districts. Thank you again for your time and support. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Sargent, uh, you know, for the uh, great wealth of information. Um, Vice Chair Harley? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Deanna, um, for that, that overview. It was very, very helpful. Um, one thing that I'm excited to hear is that the focus really sounds like it's it's around affordable housing. And as you mentioned, um, it is a great need, not only in the city, but we know across, um, all across, everywhere. <clears throat> but uh, my question is this, so these these seven houses, were these originally land bank houses? Bef yeah, were they originally land bank houses before they um, became available for Jumpstart? Mr. Chair, may I, may I uh, answer that? Yes. Uh, no, they, they were not land bank houses. Uh, they were in the uh, city's inventory. Uh, at one point, they were they are eligible to move to the land bank through the memorandum of agreement. Uh, what we did during the pandemic is that uh, we brought them back in and invested those HUD funds uh, because at that point they were um, damaging properties next to them. And, and uh, we hope that we could uh, do exactly what we're doing today is, is make sure that they are gonna be redeveloped and uh, have folks that are interested in doing it. Awesome. So um, the individuals that graduated from the Jumpstart cohort, are they gonna have first opportunity to, to uh, purchase these seven homes? Yes, the intent is that these homes will be exclusively available for Jumpstart Wilmington graduates to acquire and redevelop. Okay, my last question is this, is there a commitment already from any of those individuals for any of these seven houses? Yes, we have a lot of eager Jumpstart Wilmington graduates who are waiting for the launch of these, uh, actually the full 12 of the properties inclusive of the seven. And Scenario is going to do the funding? 
SANAIR will make funding available through our Jumpstart Wilmington loan program for those who are in need of a loan and would like to go through SANAIR. Um, but they will have an option to go to other lenders if they find more competitive rates. But we do have a, a loan program that's exclusively for our Jumpstart Wilmington graduates to take advantage of. Sounds like an excellent program. It definitely, definitely does. So thank you, Deanna. And thank you, um, Director Weir. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, and and uh, housekeeping matter, I, I would like to be added as a co-sponsor on this matter as I, um, Council Member Fields has is, is, is been uh, keeping me up to date on this and, and uh, I'm very excited to, to see it spread throughout the, the rest of West Side, actually, Hilltop especially, as I know that's the uh, area that we plan to hit next uh, in terms of trying to um, rebuild the housing stock. So thank you very much, Council Member Fields taking the lead on this and uh, look forward to uh, starting this program. Um, since this is an ordinance, it does need to be formally voted out of committee. Um, so at this time, I want to introduce, uh, entertain a motion to, uh, to move ordinance 22-30 uh, 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 out of committee to full council for vote. And council Chair, our president has his hand yes, up. Yes, uh, and before we get to that, uh, uh, Council President Conga. Yeah, thank you. I'd just like to be added as a co-sponsor. All right. So I would noted. too, Mr. Mr. Chair. I would like to be added as a co-sponsor too. Okay. Uh, so noted. All right. Uh, at this time, I will entertain the motion uh, to move the ordinance to a full full committee. Full so committee. move. All right. Uh, is there a second? Is there a second? Second. All right. It's been properly moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? All right. Uh, the ayes have it by voice vote. And I believe uh, since this is time sensitive, will this be on the, uh, the, the next council meeting on the 14th this past night? Yes, that's correct. Okay. It will be the council meeting on July 14th. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and finally, moving to the last agenda item on the um, tonight, is a resolution approving the grant of a license to Westside Grove to 1641 West 4th Street to hold a small business pop-up event. Uh, and um, I am the prime sponsor on this as, as I can shed, shed a little bit of light on this. Um, this is a, a matter that has come, um, it's really a housekeeping matter. Um, this is a event that has already actually taken place in, in terms of use of West 4th Street um, but this, this summer, uh, Westside Grows, I believe, intends to make full use of the property. And uh, because it is a city-owned vacant lot, I believe we have to go through the kind of legal hoops of just making sure that there's a grant um, so they continue to use this to support our small business community, um, especially in the Hilltop area. So um, I believe we do have, uh, do we have anyone from the administration here to talk on this? Uh, I, I'm I'm available, uh, Mr. Chair. Okay. Just is, is there any uh, light to shed, uh, Director Weir? Well, this resolution, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Chairman, is is to approve a grant uh, for a license for Westside Grows. Uh, it's at the lot of Fourth and Dupont. Uh, I believe Gabby uh, from Westside Grows is available to to address uh, any of the specifics, but I'd like to share with the committee that uh, the requirements of indemnification of the city by Westside Grows, uh, indemnification of the city by individual vendors, there's gonna be security necessary, there's gonna be proper permitting necessary, and then of course the site uh, will be uh, required to be cleaned and free of trash and debris at the end of, of each event. Uh, that, that's very typical of what the real estate and housing de uh, department does when there is a license granted. Uh, this monthly small pop-up, um, I, I, would, I would defer to someone uh, from Westside Grows. I do have the dates, but I'd much rather have uh, someone who's um, actually in a, in a hands-on position to, uh, to go into greater detail. All right. Thank you very much, Director Ware. And I believe we have uh, Ms. Ms. Lantieri, uh, Gabby from Westside Grows. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening, and the floor is yours, Gabby. Hi, everyone. Um, so as you all know, I am Gabby from uh, Cornerstone West. We're also known as Westside Grows Together. I'm the Economic Development Manager, and I'm here on behalf of our Economic Development Team 
uh, to represent our proposal to utilize this lot specifically for monthly pop ups to support our small businesses. Uh, particularly, we would like to utilize this monthly event to support our entrepreneurs uh, that are currently without a physical location, brick and mortar. So it's a lot of our black and brown entrepreneurs that are mobile businesses or vending um, and providing them with an opportunity to sell their wares and goods on a monthly basis. Um, as it was mentioned, we would maintain uh, the, the space in terms of cleanliness and security as well. Um, we would like to start utilizing the property as soon as possible just to take advantage of the, the weather um, and the extra daylight that we have uh, through the fall. Um, we have done uh, similar events like this um, in partnership, uh, as some of you may know, uh, Pastor Quincy from Milk and Honey uh, did a small business Saturday event. We also hosted a similar event um, at Books and Bagels, uh, which is our, our local bookstore on the west side. Um, so we're really looking to revitalize and, and brighten that, that specific location, um, building off of the strength of our Solomon Court project that's right up the street. Um, it's also in close proximity to one of our, our partners, Be Ready CDC, um, and all of their great work along 4th Street and on the west side. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions um, or if there's any other specific uh, items you need addressed. Uh, this, the only question, Gabby, is this, do, do we have the dates just so um, the public can be aware of? of yeah, their... so uh, the dates, if you give me one second. I need to just pull up um, an email from my my colleague Jackie Castaneda. She is the one that's going to be coordinating uh, all the events, and she did email out those dates. Um, one moment, I apologize. No problem. So uh, the event is to be a four hour event held July through September. It would start from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, and in October, due to the light, it would be from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. I don't think that we have a specific date for July selected, um, but that is the plan in terms of a schedule once we are approved to utilize the lot. And, and it'll be a Saturday. Yeah, so, I think the goal is for it to be on Saturdays, to be like a okay. small business Saturday event. Um, uh, I, in terms of our usage, would we only have access to it on that on Saturdays, or would we be allowed to utilize it for other events? Um, that's a question more for real estate and housing. Uh, I don't know, if Director, where are, are you prepared to answer that? Is is the use multifaceted, different days, a little bit the license? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as far as the uh, identification and, and insurances, uh, they would have to be included into the contract. So okay. that, uh, you know, other than, um, you know, a blanket any day, any time, I think that it would be best if we had dates, but uh, okay. we can be flexible with that. Okay, I just, I just wasn't, I, I, that's fine. I just was kind of asking what the procedure was in terms of access to it, um, just because if we do have like 24 hour access to it that means that we have to manage it for 24 hours and clean up so um i think it would be better to start to have it be uh saturdays once a month um starting in july and i'm happy to to figure out that what that first date is and get that to uh councilman johnson okay all right thank you very much will and we can definitely talk all, all, all offline about that um but nevertheless um since this is a resolution it does not need to be formally voted out of committee tonight. Um, and I believe, Marshall, uh, will this be able to be placed on the July 14th agenda as well? Yes, that's correct, Chairman. All right, understood. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Director Weir. And of course, uh, Gabby from Westside Grove, thank you for uh, joining us. Thank All you, right. everyone. At this time, uh, we've now concluded the Finance and Economic Development Committee meeting um, for, for July.
Um, and, and again, I appreciate everyone staying tuned and staying informed, especially regarding the uh, you know, fast moving and ever changing landscape of ARPA and infrastructure funds. So thank you for joining us. Um, we do, we are getting ready to go on uh, um, council summer break um, starting July 15th through August 15th. Um, so we will keep everyone apprised, uh, apprised as to the date and time of the August meeting uh, for the finance committee. So um, uh, otherwise I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. All right, there's a second. Second. All right, then properly moved and second it. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All right, all right. any opposed? All right, well, thank you very much. The meeting has concluded and I look forward to uh, everyone have a safe, of course, a summer break and I look forward to seeing everyone at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.